they did um, understand that LEDs were where lighting was going, but it's very hard. And there was a book around the time that we were doing all of this by Clayton Christensen called uh, the Innovator, the Disruptive, what was it called? The Innovator's Dilemma, which was all about disrupting markets. Some of his work has been, you know, people are sort of cool on the idea, the general idea, but um, I think it held some validity there where in, the, in terms of companies holding their own uh, business close but, and not investing in new technologies or new methods or new ways of doing things because they're so entrenched. And that we makes did, sense. We I've did, seen that at certain organizations I've worked for. Oh yeah, it's it's it can get pretty bad. It can it can withhold a it can stop a company from investing in a whole new area that they should be. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Hi, welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Kevin Dowling. Kevin's the CEO of Carta. Carta makes navigational equipment for robots and also handheld. Basically, they're scanning devices where you can learn an environment and make a 3D model of it. Uh, Kevin, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Thanks, Spencer. Yes, yeah, a lot of fun. Um, cool. Yeah, we not only robots, but applications where people need maps of as-built uh, facilities, whether they're the buildings or the interiors of spaces. Uh, we're not only providing hardware solutions if people need that, but we're also licensing our software specifically cool. and mostly in the robotics area. So give me some examples, I guess, of use cases where people are using this in, in like construction. I saw the one of the of the aircraft, but I, I don't want to say too much, I feel like. Which one on the aircraft? The I think there was there was a large uh, military oh, aircraft. Oh, yes. So Hercules? Yes, that's exactly what it was. So it was a C-130 Hercules, which is one of the planes, the massive cargo planes uh, used in World War II. And I think most of them <laughs> that are still flying are of that age. But they keep them running and they keep upgrading them. And uh, the 9 11th Air Wing out here in the Pittsburgh airport um, allowed us to come in and do a scan of that. That's so, badass. In about 15 minutes, we were able to completely scan the uh, fuselage, the wings, the engines, the props, and... Uh, and I watched that demo. It's a really detailed try. I mean, maybe we can edit that in, Carl. You know? Sure. Yeah, yeah there's a... Uh, it's it's a very nice thing. In fact, we have a nice 3D video where you can sort of swoop around it and see it. So the accuracy of our systems is, for creating these models, is limited by the grade of LiDAR that we're using, and many other people are using too, Yeah. but automotive grade LiDARs are not quite survey quality, meaning five millimeters or better, Yeah. but uh, generally they're good enough to do buildings, and we're typically accurate to within a centimeter, you know, it's awesome. almost a third of an inch um, uh, within, within a facility, so it works quite well for that. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Is there a reason you picked um, the automotive LiDAR over, like, it would be Trish, like a total station, I think, is what they use for surveying. Yeah, the total station is sort of the, the top of the line accuracy mm -hmm. measurements, but they're discrete. There's typically a single beam oh. that goes out and measures, and it can measure to within millimeters over a kilometer range. That's insane. Which is fantastic. But if you wanted to sweep and do an entire thing, it would have to be controlled and you'd have to sweep it. It would just take forever, I imagine. It would take forever, um, uh, in part because to get a good and accurate reading, you can't be sweeping across and getting readings as fast as you sweep. Whereas the automotive grade LIDARs, which is sort of on the other end of the spectrum, um, you're able to sweep a 360 degree view, sometimes in, in the form of an annulus, so a circular donut shaped region. Got it. Uh, you can basically provide the um, that scan within a fraction of a second, typically 100 milliseconds. Um, yeah. So really between, cool. you know, for ones that are around so today, 300 10 readings every second. Just to... Exactly. Okay. So about uh, 300,000 points per second, up to 700,000 points per second. There are some that are reaching a million points per second, which starts to get quite good. But you are spreading it out over 360 degrees. Your range is typically 100, maybe 200 meters, depending on which ones. Are you still using the Belladine units on your... So we use a, a mix of LiDAR, but okay. uh, Velodyne is certainly one we use in our products. You can see that. Um, we've, of course, evaluated many types of LiDAR. There's, oh gosh, there are probably 30 to 40 companies right now oh, trying cool. to make LiDARs for auto, mostly the automotive I'd business. Be, I mean, this is kind of nerdy now and getting in the nitty gritty, but I'd be interested to hear a little more about what you found and sure. 
what you like versus what you don't. Well, let, let me answer your other question, which was what would be a higher grade lidar. So between a total station and, and one of these, <laughs> one of these um, automotive grade, as I call them, uh, there are lidars made by companies like Regal and Leica, which are very, very high quality, but oh, cool. they have a price commensurate with their performance. What does it run you for one of those units? Tens of thousands. Okay. Uh, typically. And you get a Velodyne uh, VLP 16 puck for like 6 to 12K. If you buy in any significant quantities, you can bring that down pretty significantly. Nice. You'll start to see LiDARs in the I've market. Seen them on the eBay market for like a grand. Yes, that's right. You can get used ones or ones that are still in a box. Yeah. Um, in fact, we have a few extras that we'll, we'll likely do that as well nice. uh, in the near future. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are Velodyne's things. That... been interesting. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, all the SPACs, this whole advent of the SPAC, which is a spe special purpose acquisition company, has brought a lot of investors out of the woodwork to go and invest in these, hoping to go public and then make a killing on that. The problem is many of these people really haven't taken companies public, even in a traditional sense. Interesting. So going through an IPO, a traditional IPO, is a long process, and the gestation period is often years because you want to have consecutive profitable quarters. So I've, I've done this with, with one company, um, Color Kinetics years ago, was, yeah. which was later by Phillips. By Phillips. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's really so cool. We went public in 04, and then we uh, were acquired by Phillips in 2007, but almost exactly three years later. That's awesome. Um, which, which was a great learning experience. It's also a pretty short acquisition cycle. I mean, that's Incredible. Well, you know, once you go public, everything is transparent. All the financials are open. You know exactly what people, how people value the company. You have a fixed number of shares, and and you can ascribe a, a value to them based on the stock market price. And yeah, in many acquisitions, you hope for uh, people acquiring you for more than the current stock price, more than the market cap, which is the price per share times the number of shares. So there are lots of ways for companies to do that once they've gone public in that way. With these SPACs, though, it's sort of interesting to watch because some, some of them are going public before they have revenue. It's very different That's from sort of the traditional IPOs. And even that revenue is often pilot projects or short-run uh, productions of these. Most of this, um, uh, to my knowledge, all of the SPAC companies are primarily doing widgets. They're creating LIDARs, not that dissimilar from the shape of this drinking glass for automotive use. And they're all competing for what each one of them claims is 50% of the automotive market. <laughs> so you can do the math better than I can. So, uh, yeah, how do you... I'm not sure how, about all that. Yeah, how do, you, how do you justify that? And how do you yeah. get away with that? So it's going to be really interesting. I get a lot of emails. It kind of reminds me of cryptocurrency a little bit where you've got, you know, thousands of competing currencies and maybe you'll see 20 of them that, you know, end up taking off eventually. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's a free-for-all right now. It's sort of a wild west of it. But these companies, after a couple of years, and many of them are not conversant in the earnings calls and other things. You really need people who understand that, know how to do investor relations, and know how to, uh, you know, position the company in a certain way. And very often, they're, you know, this is my personal. This is not Representative Cardo or anyone else. Is sure. just the naivete around uh, what it means to be public. Okay. It's it's going to be uh, shocking for a lot of people. What are some of the things that I guess you learned when you took Color Kinetics public that, that sort of influenced that? I mean, I realize it's probably years of experience and you can't distill it down into... Well, I mean, there's so many aspects to it. Like one, one example is the prospectus. The, the prospectus for uh, an IPO is the, is the document that sh tells you every should tell you everything. It should also reveal any things that are hidden. It should also reveal the risks that you see in that business. And you can't lie on that because it's a crime if you do. Um, but not only that, the whole process, at least, so this is going back a few years now. I, I think some of this process has changed. But uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, for example, the, the, the rigor to which you're yeah. held and reporting numbers and so forth is quite strong. You have to meet GAP. You have to, uh, all of these things have Generally to happen. Generally accept accounting principles. Right, yes. Uh, for the viewer. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of acronyms in finance as well as technology. So, yeah. um, uh, and some of them, I don't think people know what they are. So, <laughs> well, some of them are overloaded. I, I remember I was at that's uh, good point. Good point. Talking to a gentleman from uh, General Electric, and they mentioned POCs. I'm like, like a point of contact, no, <laughs> proof of concept. You know? Yes, there are many. Yeah. 
I remember at a NASA meeting once for one of the projects I had where there were the number of syllables. <laughs> well, they had lots of TLAs, three three letter acronyms, and then in fact they had something called the ADD, which was the Acronym Data Dictionary. That's hilarious. <laughs> So there was a whole dictionary in NASA, and you could find many NASA entries. needs that more than anybody else, I oh, think. Just everything's an acronym, and they talk in a shorthand all the yeah. time. But I don't think as technologists we're that, that different. We, we do very much the same thing. I, I do as well, and I'm guilty of it, and I, I hate it and I love it because I feel like when you're trying to explain really complicated concepts and you, you start to reference things from earlier in the paper or the discussion, you know, that's when it really becomes in handy because otherwise you're going to be saying a million words, you know, and it just gets cumbersome. Right. Um, yeah. But, you know, with an acronym, you can get around that. But I think if you just go right to the acronym and you never define it, then you're... Yeah, that's... Nobody knows um, when anybody writes about. documentation and other things, I, I pick up on this very quickly because I, I don't like it. Define it the first time you exactly. show it. That's, and then from then on... You as well. You have to do that. Otherwise, somebody is not going to understand it or they'll confuse it, like, as you pointed out, overloading the operator. Um, you want to make sure that you've defined it so people are conversing with it. Yeah. It's so important to speak with clarity around these types of That's topics. That's actually one of the things I learned from Lee. <laughs> you know, oh, yes. Say, yeah, Lee say, Weiss. Yeah, yeah. Lee Weiss, uh, yeah, my second cousin, uh, one of your teachers. Yep. Great guy. But he... Uh, he just said to me, like, I think he sat me down one time. And he was like, just say it in simple language. Like, don't overcomplicate it. Don't. Lee you know, was very good at. Better than people. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was exceptional at communicating his own research and work. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of people liked what he did because he did he did it that way. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I was always trying to find shortcuts. Like, I would say things to him. Like, well, why can't you just hire somebody to write all that stuff? <laughs> He's like, you can't do that. Because yeah. you don't understand the stuff. That's right. <laughs> It took me a long time to get that lesson, you know, through, and uh, yeah, I think it. Well, he Lee had to write a thesis, as as most people with doctorates did, and uh, he took a long time to. And servos, right? That's right, servo mechanisms, servo controls. Yeah. He was exceptionally good at that, yeah. and many other things. Three D printing. He was one of the pioneers in that. He had the first metal three D printed part in his office, right? Like on on display. Yeah, he was very early. In fact, I think he was responsible in large part for getting one of the very first uh, printers from, I think it was three D Systems actually back in the in the mid to late eighties, um, at mechanical engineering department over at Carnegie Mellon. And then later he, years later he started applying that to biological materials. Yeah, I remember that. Phenomenal. But it was two D, right? But he was with biological, I think. Yeah, he was building that scaffolding for. Complex shapes. So it would have been 3D. I'm an idiot. 3D, yes. Yeah. Can fly it in. Okay, there was some other 2D project he had with linear induction motors, but mm. it might have been a different thing. Yeah, he was always doing some amazing things. Yeah, the guy had like 40 patents. Uh, to mention, the guy recently passed away. That's why we're talking about him like this. But oh, okay. Yeah. Solid dude. Uh, <laughs> like he, he, a lot he'd be big worth the retrospective. There was, there was a nice uh, obituary that was, or bio, I'm sorry, a bio recently that the School of Computer Science sent out. Uh, it was relatively short, but it, it captured a lot of what, what he did and why he deserves a lot of uh, credit for what he did. I have to read that. Michael Furman called me and told me I should check it out. And I, oh, uh, okay, I, I can send that to you. look at that yet. Thank you. Yeah, remind me after this and I'll, I'll just quickly forward it to you. I really appreciate it. And Mike Furman is a well-known name, too, because he was in the same lab as, as we were back at the early days of the Robotics Institute. And later at CARTA, I had him do some of the first initial studies in accuracy. Because He's, he's awesome, right? Like, yeah. I mean, the, the work that he's done for, for our teams as well, I mean, where he's just... I haven't even asked him to do it. He'll bang out, you know, feasibility studies. And <laughs> she's like, hey, look, I can track this thing. <laughs> Check it yeah. out. No, I, I, I like that guy a lot. It's a nice study. So our first technical report was uh, was co-authored by Mike. Yeah. When, when Lee introduced me to him the first time, he said he's very, very from. Just have to bear up. Very, very what? Uh, like, like super religious Jewish, right? Oh, so, okay. Like, you're you're going to have to bear with him. You know? <laughs> I, I didn't know that was a term. That's really cool. Yeah. And so um, yeah, I, just, I, I didn't know either. I had to Google it, I think, to understand okay. it. <laughs> I, um, I'm, I'm I, I looked it up and, you know, I'd say, ah, yeah, well, solid guy. So, yeah, he <laughs> yeah. is. Mexico we'll, we'll like him a lot but um yeah so just to backpedal a bit um and i, I don't mean to gloss oh you were you were going say, back I, to the um uh lidar and talking about i was going to ask landscape. about color kinetics and, and some oh, more that's of the right. investor stuff but we could also talk about lidar either one's cool yeah i think pretty I'm, tangential on the show <laughs> if you that. well 
Color Kinetics, when we went public, we had 13 consecutive profitable quarters. Okay. So that set a track record. That's and, the, and they were increasing, right? Yeah. And the revenue was growing, margin dollars were growing, EBITDA was growing. And uh, so it set a very good EBITDA? precedent. Uh, EBITDA is uh, earnings before interest taxes. And, and Got it. <laughs> I, I, the one I learned in business school was EBIT, which was just earnings before interest and taxes. So right. the, the I didn't know, but I, I got it. Okay. Yeah. So there's uh, a lot of ways to evaluate companies. And so these numbers are often used to gauge how profitable a company is, what room they have to grow and so forth. But if you're earning more and more and more and more, just to put it in layman's terms, I mean, that's appealing to a company like Philips. That wants oh, to sure. Yeah. Get into that game. Especially when we were competing with them, they had an LED group because they did get, they did um, understand that LEDs were where lighting was going, but it's very hard. And there was a book around the time that we were doing all of this by Clayton Christensen called uh, the innovative, the disruptive, what was it called? The Innovator's Dilemma, which was all about disrupting markets. Some of his work has been, you know, people are sort of cool on the idea, the general idea, but uh, I think it held some validity there where in the in terms of companies holding their own uh, business close and not investing in new technologies or new methods or new ways of doing things because they're so entrenched. And that makes did, sense. I've did, seen that at certain organizations I've worked for. Oh yeah, it's it's it can get pretty bad. It can it can withhold a it can stop a company from investing in a whole new area that they should be. So LED yeah, can sink it. It can sink a ship, right? I mean, look at like Kodak, right, as a good example. Yes, of that, where it, they just kind of stuck to film and they never wanted to go beyond. Even that. worse, they invented the digital camera. OLED, right? They came up. <laughs> with... No, before OLEDs, they invented the digital camera, the imaging device that would store an image and later they could print it out. And their research group up in. Uh, Rochester actually did create that. And then they put it aside because the people who were doing silver halide and all of the film chemistry and all of that saw their business being threatened by this thing. But if, if Kodak didn't do it, someone else was sure to because that was semiconductor based, much like LEDs, which were also semiconductor based lighting. Yeah. And so if you're going up against semiconductors, you're going to lose because <laughs> Moore's law is inexorable, right? It is, yep. it is plateauing now and they're, Lots of issues. That is every 18 months, the number of semiconductors you can fit into a surface area. Doubles. Yeah. Okay. So Gordon Moore postulated this and, and had a few years of tracking back in the late 60s where he said, it's interesting, the number of transistors per per die is increasing, roughly doubling every 24 months or so. 24 months, okay. Thank and um, But it, sometimes it accelerated even beyond that. But for 30 odd years, Moore's Law held true. And if you were in a race against semiconductors, <laughs> you are not going to win. And uh, it became a, electronics it, becomes a thing, right? Right. And it, yeah. but it also became a self-fulfilling prophecy because people would make the investments to keep Moore's law growing. And so to create a fad to build the chips that the designs of which would be used in our daily lives and everything, headphones, microphones, doorknobs, everything. Yeah. Um, we're predicated on making sure that the next investment, the larger surface, the smaller lines used to create those semiconductors kept track with Moore's Law. And for decades, that happened. It's awesome. not accelerating quite the same space, but at the same pace these days, but it is it is still improving. It still seems to be going, though. I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, when you look at some of the stuff in GPUs that NVIDIA is doing. And... But that's more of the architecture as opposed to the alignments. Point. So, yeah. but, but GPUs were a, a great way to continue to accelerate processing. And then when people realized they could use this for AI work and so forth, that became, oh, wow, we can... The first time you saw a graphics card without a graphics port on it, I think, was maybe like seven years ago, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I started noticing that I was at a certain place I was working at at the time. And um, I was like, wow, this is, this is interesting. Well, high-speed graphics calculations and linear algebra and other things, and they can be used for many types of solutions to many different problems. And the architecture for those devices is continuing to improve. Yeah, I agree. You know, even for us, we use standard off-the-shelf computers, but we, we started to integrate a, a GPU to do a stitching of panoramic views in real time. Can I, um, can I ask what you're using or is that? Uh, it's an NVIDIA uh, okay. device, a Jetson actually. Cool. Uh, NX, uh, AGX? I don't recall the no part number, but uh, <laughs> and we're, 
And in the Xavier is one that one of our customers is using. So we've redone our code. So it runs on a Xavier, which is the next generation. That of course, NVIDIA wants everyone to move to anyway. They're a bit more expensive. The Xavier encompasses, I think, the NX and the AGX. And the Jetson line is the TX2. And I don't know. So the real problem we do this now is... project, obviously. Well, <laughs> the the real stuff. difficulty as of today, um, it's very difficult to get Jetsons. Yeah. And so they're forcing people in a way because they're making allocations of resources and money at TSMC, which now has limited capacity because of the semiconductor shortage. And thus, um, NVIDIA is forced to make these decisions, which aren't always in favor of the customer, but it's the only way they decisions are you referring to? Well, they can, they only have a certain amount of capacity available to them at TSMC, which is the world's largest semiconductor fab, um, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. Thank you. Um, and uh, so they have to decide, do they want to build more of, more of these or more of those or get rid, you know, for the moment, put these aside and just do the Jetsons? Which is why the Jetsons have gone up so much in value of these past. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a, t a rough road for the next year or so, I think, maybe longer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of production and supply chains, logistics and other things are causing a lot of problems. It's been interesting. Uh, we had a follow on from NASA. Uh, I want to say last week we was talking about trying to get a, um, we'll say a communication protocol converter chip um, that, you know, should have retailed for a very low amount of money and they needed a certain number for a mission to space. <laughs> and I think the number was, I'm going to get this wrong, but like reference the last episode if you're curious. Uh, I think the number was 40, but they can only get 15s. Now they have to fly the ones that they've been testing with. And Air freight is much more expensive than on the water. <laughs> and, and you used to be able to get a... Um... A cargo container for 5,000 bucks. You could fill it and ship it in 45 days on the water. It gets through Port of LA or wherever it goes. And that was, um, a, a, you know, it worked. It worked well yeah. as long as you could plan for it. But if you need it faster, you start paying air freight and your costs double. Yep, yeah. exactly. And now the container, by the way, they, there's so well, many. It's scary. They just don't exist. Yeah, they're yeah, that, being yeah. used or they're piling up somewhere in the world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're going up to 10,000 or 15,000 now to get a cargo container. It used to cost 4500 Yeah. Wow. Exactly. So supply chain is going to be disrupted for a while. In fact, I was just talking with the head of supply chain for one of the local robotics companies yesterday, and he said he's seeing parts on a 55-week lead time, Holy electronic crap. parts. Some DigiKey and Mouse are normal suppliers like that? Uh, they're going, typically, their volumes are such that they, they don't have to go through those distributors, but um, they might go maybe through a Newark or Aero one of the bigger ones. It makes sense. But even they, you know, it's tough. Future is one of the largest. Yeah. Uh, so, and they're, you know, you, it's pretty easy now to search through all of these places and the ones that carry stock are, you know, in a good position, but they're running I'm short. Sure they can charge an arm and a leg for that stuff. I mean, it's and, as good as gold. And they are. <laughs> it's supply and demand. <laughs> I heard about STM32 chips going for $160 a chip the other day. Um, from a defense manufacturer that I, that I keep in touch with. That's ridiculous. That was, yeah. what, a $20 part or something like that? Less than that even, yeah. I imagine. It's, it's getting insane. Um, it, you know, people are making do right now, but it's it's really tough if this continues. Yeah, I, I agree. It's affecting, you know, there are car production plants sitting idle for the lack of a chip. Do you think there's going to be opportunities where maybe certain companies will emerge that can figure out a way to manufacture, or is it just so difficult to... Well, it's all the pieces of it. So mo many chips, so if you look at semiconductors, for example, the wafers are made in fabs. Those fabs can be in multiple places in the world. You might have some in Japan, a few in America. Intel has the bulk of them. Global foundries, I think. Global foundries is a, is a big one too. Um, but most of those dyes, and then TSMC, but most of those dyes end up going to Southeast Asia, typically in Malaysia, to be packaged. So they're diced, packaged, and then uh, you have these little high-speed sort of sewing machine looking things that do all the wire bonding to the chips oh, cool. and, and packaging is getting so sophisticated it's no longer the ant-like black encapsulated packages with little legs on them they're yep. all surface mount and surface mount has moved to ball grid arrays and these are getting very sophisticated and yeah i agree they're very specialized as to who can do those you know it used to be the case you, you and i could well, go even in the fab i mean it's getting sophisticated where oh i mean completely. global foundries i guess was acquired recently right which is public knowledge and um 
the level that they could hit, I, I don't understand fabs enough to really know this, but I mean, it's just not many places in the world can do that. Oh, well, they're at nanometer lines now, and I just saw an article yesterday, they're moving to angstroms. Like you have to measure now Seriously? in angstroms, wavelengths of light, Holy crap. <laughs> or less, much less, actually. That's, um, that's incredible. Yeah. So this stuff boggles my mind, obviously. I, I feel like people are way smarter than me are working on this, but... There are a lot of good people investing heavily in this. Um, also, even packaging is now where most of the cost is, and also a lot of the research efforts, because if you could do, for, exa for example, three silicon vias where you may not need to do the wire bonding, okay. uh, you can start to stack dyes. There's a tremendous amount of good work going into repackaging these systems. Silicon on chip, or uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to package multiple dyes in a small area, too. Interesting. The thermal issues will... You know, be there forever, but uh, <laughs> as we all know, strap a giant hunk of metal onto that. I guess of course, cooling, water cooling. I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that people are doing. Yeah. So I think there's still a ways to improve cost, performance, packaging. That'll you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of ro runway left in, in doing that. Uh, Moore's law is sort of plateauing, but it's uh, you know somebody's going to come up with some very clever architectures. AI type techniques may allow you to do more processing in a shorter period of time to get this get to the same result it makes a lot of sense yeah it's it's exciting it's always been exciting watching the semiconductor industry yeah I, it sounds like you're watching a lot closer than i am so I'm... i did for a long time I, I i would say in the last few years i haven't watched it nearly as closely i still get some of the magazines in that uh in that area because there were freebies you know the trade magazines the <laughs> circle of bingo card that kind of thing that's cool. Um, but so I often will flip through those just to see what interesting things are doing in metrology, packaging, uh, and then semiconductors itself. So I've been trying to, and again, this is just kind of a personal shortcoming, but I've been trying to understand metrology in that context for a while. Um, if you had to explain it like you would a child, <laughs> what, what, what exactly does that field entail? Well, and the, how does it help the industry? Um, it, it certainly helps a lot. You need ways of, when you're doing packaging at, of line widths and you want to connect to these chips, you need to be able to get to, a, say, a pad that is formed on the surface of a die, which okay. is sliced out from these large 300 millimeter uh, discs, which are the silicon wafers that are okay. made. So you start with a 300 millimeter wafer. It's a sliced. Sometimes there's a in addition to the dicing process, you might have a grind because you want to make it thinner, and then you want to package more of these things together. Um, so the metrology literally running a grinder over it to sort of it's a, often a chemical etch or a chemical okay. chemical uh, what is it CMP CMP uh, it's chemical mechanical planarization. I, okay. I, I think it's they've shortened the, the me mechanic mechanization part of it, but it's a way to etch the back side of a of a of a die or even an entire wafer. So a part that would be hard to get at normally because it's the backside or? Well, they want to decrease the thickness point. because sometimes they want to create channels through the die itself into an adjacent. Those would be those chip. vias you were talking about. Right. Yeah. And then so you need good metrology to make sure you're doing it well. When you metrology, make Metrology, just again for the viewers, that's just measurement. Measurement right, of all level. kinds, yeah. yeah. So they have, because of the line widths are getting down to, you need a very advanced microscopes just to see yeah. what's going on and the resists and so forth. It makes sense. Are you flying blind, like open loop, as it were? Like, you know, you want to go a certain number of angstroms into the thing. And... So typically the mechanism will allow you, they're, they're very high grade, optical grade uh, mechanisms to be able to move you around to see a particular spot. Okay. And then, then you can, if you know the sort of underlying map, you can then identify where you are. And move. But um, I don't think that they're open loop, though. Um, that makes sense to me. I, I just yeah. wanted to... Because you, you're talking about measurement from, I assume, the edge, but maybe that's not how it actually works. I think they, they find uh, there are typically patterns etched into the resist as well. So, Because part of the problem is sometimes they're doing as many four, as 400 recipe steps for a microprocessor. Wow. And so you're doing a bunch, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands on a single large wafer, and you need to register all of those together. So if you with each time you go in to do passivization or, or um, other uh, operations on the wafer, you need to register the new mask with the old mask. And, and so you have these patterns that are now etched in there to help you align all of these. You keep, you're not stacking them, but you're doing them sequentially in order to, to yeah. do that. And uh, how is that different than stacking? 
Well, stacking, you, you really want to be able to create routings at different layers within the chip. And so you, you, you dope it with these different chemicals. You sometimes will etch away with a, um, an etchant, um, okay. which will eat away. And then you'll lay, lay another level of resist down. You might planarize oh, cool. it after that, and it just keeps when going. When you planarize, that's just like putting an epoxy layer down? Oh, well, yeah, plan. very, very similar. They're often using uh, polyamide um, to do that. And then, uh, yes, you'll, you'll, you'll apply a layer of goop and you'll <laughs> wear, wear it down and uh, you're creating 3d structures and you're doing that layer by layer cool, at, cool, at, a, cool. at a level that is just incredible it, it is sort of a 3d printing yeah but it sounds like it very small layers <laughs> yeah in a way that most people will never have access to i mean i, I would assume just a clean room you need alone to do that i mean it's it's class one clean rooms you need a I used to work for a company that did um, automated transport of the of the wafers within the fab. They're trying to get humans out of the fab because we're we're walking bags of dirt basically. Yeah. We shed hair, we shed skin cells, you know. Even if you've just taken a shower, so that's why you see people in the bunny suits. In the class sense. one systems, the bunny suits are complete booties all the way to uh, helmets, uh, not helmets, but masks and uh, head coverings and so forth. Makes sense. Um, you want you want to you know one of the Thing, key things that we had to do with that company is called PRI Automation. It was later acquired by Brooks Automation. And uh, we made transport systems and guides that would grab these, these uh, foops, which are front opening universal pods that held the wafers. So in an Intel factory at the time, you're in a Pentium factory. This is how long ago yeah, this was. I remember um, You might have a stack of more than a dozen of, of these. Penny twos as a kid, I would. Yeah. On the shelf. Yeah. So, but if you had a stack of a, more than a dozen, say 15 or so, 300 millimeter wafers etched with hundreds of Pentium chips. You were talking about a, more than a million dollars worth of chips in one package. Oh, and occasionally God. they got dropped <laughs> and they turned to sand. <laughs> so they're, they're useless. Their, their value just completely disappeared. There's no recovery from that. Wow. So when a machine, when a human does that, it's, it's really bad and probably let that person go there or they move into another part of the factory. Um, but when a machine does that, it's just, just as bad. And they want to, yeah. you know, when Intel said you, you jump, you said how high and you sent your team out there to, to fix that machine. Yeah. So getting a chance to see fabs and how they work and what's so with was just a great experience from, you know, they're going from sand that create pools of silicon. They, then that gets sliced um, and prepared for the wafers uh, to go into the fab, and then the fab do you know these hundreds of these very long recipes, which could take days to get through a fab. Yeah. Uh, so ramping all of that up and having all the machines. But it sounds in the right like you're order. creating a crazy amount of value. I mean, if one of those is worth millions of dollars, you know that's. Oh yeah, yeah. But when when those finally those chips are sliced or diced out of the wafer, they're then packaged, put in a chip, and you'd sell that Pentium for, at that time, I don't know, fifty bucks, something like that. Um, and then today it's not that much different. Our architecture is a, is a big part of it. Um, our market architecture is getting very, um, popular and especially mobile and Seems to be. Uh, Intel missed the boat on that. And, um, but they're, they're coming back. They're going for server farms and other things right now. Nice. Doing a nice job. So it's, it's fun to watch, watch the industry and it's a very cyclic industry too. Absolutely. So I, at one point, I, I left PRI for a couple of reasons, but I had a chance to join a small startup in Boston called Color Kinetics. And, <laughs> um, it was a lot of fun. And that yes. was my MBA, right? I, I started, a, I was an idiot because I had a family, a growing family, two young children, had a long commute so, so we could afford a house on the outside of Boston. Yeah. And then, um, and at that time when we moved there, it was much closer to where PRI was than Boston, which is where Color Kinetics was, downtown Boston. Yeah. And over, uh, and I started an MBA program. So I took a, a semester's worth of courses. So you were literally doing an MBA. I, yeah. I thought you meant that running Color Kinetics was like a surrogate for an MBA. Okay. I see. It did become that. So I started the MBA. It's full of hard knocks. And I realized it was an idiotic move. And then later I realized, you know, I had that education you know, working with a fantastic team at Color Kinetics. Yeah, so I was head awesome. of engineering, but um, I, I didn't start it. It was two inventors from uh, Carnegie Mellon, George Mueller, and E. Horlis. George unfortunately passed away about um, you know, many months ago. Um, uh, but they they created the company and um, brought in funding. We brought in a great team of people, uh, eventually someone to lead the company. We went, went public and then got acquired. And I stayed on with Philips for two and a half years, longer than the lo lockup period that I, I originally signed up for. 
but uh, I, I did enjoy it. Um, and then there came a point where I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and many startups, especially those that get acquired, you'll sometimes see an exodus of people, um, even if there's a, a good incentive for them to stay, yeah. it's just not as much fun. That kind of makes sense. I mean, if you get into a startup because you want to run the ship or, you know, have some influence and then a larger parent company comes in and says, this is the way you're going to do it. Well, exactly. They've always done it. They have their own way of doing things. And I remember one example, our, our CEO, uh, Jeff Cassis, um, who came in after uh, um, Bill Sims, who had run the company. Uh, I went to him one day and I said, you realize that Philips uh, is now charging us for all the IT that we did ourselves and they're charging <laughs> us more than we ever, it ever costed us. And I said, let's take the number of people and divide it into the amount of money we have to pay Philips for IT. And it was $10,000 per person per year. The CEO went, whoa. He said, but, you know, Jeff was very thoughtful about it, but he said, there's some battles I can fight. There's some battles I can't fight. That's one I cannot fight. <laughs> <laughs> but that came out of our bottom line. Um, oh, another, awesome. another example, which put me on a path to leaving, and I should say, I'm not disparaging a Phillips. It was a very uh, good company. Um, they owned the lighting market. They were one of the big yeah. three in the world. People probably remember when all light bulbs were either from Phillips, Osram, or GE. And when they were, when, when they were the gas, glass, and brass guys. Like that was that was lighting for decades. Yeah. Um, and there's a long and, and pretty interesting history of that dating all the way back to Edison and others. Wow. Um, but uh, what had happened was um, I had, while still at Color Connects, before we acquired, our team had come up with a lamp that could replace a typical PAR lamp, which is often used for outside lighting. It was going to be more expensive, but it used a fraction of the energy, and the quality of light was just as good. It probably lasts for longer, I would imagine. It lasts for much longer. So the co if you looked at the cost over a period of time, then it became a much greater uh, value to someone who would actually do the math. If you, if you only looked at the upfront cost, you wouldn't buy it. Makes sense to me. So within uh, Philips, we were bought by the Luminaires group within Philips, which is a multi-billion dollar operation in itself. Not the Lamps group, which made light bulbs. Interesting. So the Lamps group, they, they had become very stratified. Uh, so the, the Luminaire group mostly made lighting fixtures to which you put the light bulbs into. They were, it was very... An interesting decision that they ended up... Well, the, it, the whole lights. industry had moved that way over time because the lamps needed replacing because every incandescent lamp would only last 1,500 hours on yeah. average. You know, there's a record somewhere in a firehouse in California. There's one that's lasted 40 years or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for the most part, they would last a certain Has amount of time. Has it been soldered back together, I wonder? <laughs> They were actually designed. You you could make lamps that would last much longer, um, but it would affect the light output a little bit, and then it, you know, the economics of it wouldn't work as well for lighting companies. So they ended up sort of focusing on these things that uh, uh, would cause the business to continue to grow. It's a consumable, right? It's a consumable. And lighting, the lighting industry, I should point out, is only uh, its growth rate is that of GDP. It doesn't grow any faster. Interesting. Um, until LEDs came along. <laughs> that's that's fascinating. So Philips bought us. We were half, halfway through this program. We had created this light bulb. I talked to my CEO about it, and I said, I, I'd like to put this out there. The Lamps Group called me a day later and said, well, we're Lamps. You're not. We own it. So you want to give it to us? I said, that's great. Uh, are you going to market it? Well, no, we don't think it's the right time. We, we think it's too expensive. I said, well, I have a, um, I have a lighting designer specifier on the West Coast who bought fifty thousand lamps for his project that he's doing, and sort of, sort of a little pause in the end of the phone. And well, we don't, we still don't think it makes sense. For <laughs> and I said, I said, okay, well, we're, we're not getting anywhere here, but we want to build it. And so I went back to to the CEO and I said, what if we give them all the profits from the lamp? We'll make it, we'll design it, and we'll cover recover our costs. And we'll give all the profits to the lamps group. So he laughed and he said, try it. And so I went back and I called the guy again. I'm not going to name him. And I said, we'll build the lamp and uh, we'll, we'll give it to you at cost. You keep all the profits. Uh, how does that sound? It's this long pause. And it's like he's trying to find out, is there's a trick here? <laughs> what are you talking about? And he said, well, all right, all right, fine. And so we put a line up in Shanghai to build it. Nice. And I got a call from my product manager. I still remember it was very late at night. And uh, she was almost in tears. And she said, 
Phillips is here and is shutting down the line. Wait, what? Yeah. After after oh, all that, that, after their agreement. And I, I said a few choice words, and I said, let me make some calls. But they, they ended up shutting down the line. And at that point, and it was almost two years into it, I, I realized I would be leaving. And that was yeah. the attitude, would that attitude. Any person, I think, to resign. Because you, you, we already had LED products in the market. We were selling, you know, close to $100 million a year in LED lighting systems. We knew there was a market. We knew it would grow. We also, because it was a semiconductor process, I had done a, quite a bit of study a few years earlier to show when that crossover point would occur. Only I was wrong. It happened faster than I predicted. <laughs> uh, because the performance of the lamps continued to grow. The, the lumens per watt, the cost per, uh, for, per lumen continued to drop precipitously. And the quality of the light was getting close to equaling that or bettering that of traditional lamps. So was the concern that it just threatened the existing product line? Yes, absolutely. Okay. There is no doubt. So we, we had it firsthand. The, the fluorescent group said, well, fluorescents are still the, the lighting element of choice. You can date a fluorescent. You, you can tell that was, you know, like mid-90s to early 2000s if you see one of those CFLs. So oh, yeah. the only time they existed. I mean, nobody makes this. The other thing, you know, CFLs were tattered as an energy-saving lamp. Did, remember the ones that look like a pigtail? Yeah, yeah. Um, people hated those. They didn't light up in cold weather. They had still had They're used ugly. They used mercury in the in yeah. the construction of the lamp, and there's, there were there were many many reasons, probably a good dozen reasons, um, and LEDs have surpassed them. I, I, yeah, I don't. Know. Yeah, I agree. You know, anyway, it, it took a long time. I had left by that point. Um, one of the most rewarding things was we had submitted a, um, a lamp that our group had designed with a group in Philips. Um, they had come up with a remote phosphor that was very efficient. Um, we submitted this lamp to the Department of Energy and won the L Prize, which was a $10 million oh, check cool. from the Department of Energy to Philips. The nicest thing was the the people who were going to that check called me that morning early and they said, Kevin, we won. We're going to pick up the check. We want to let you know because you were a big part of that. And uh, That's awesome. I was I was really I was very happy and uh, um, just I was just taken by you know the, the the generosity and so forth. So Phillips was a great experience, and there were a few things that I realized I wanted to go into startups again. Yeah, um, that makes a lot but, of sense. Um, you know, they were a very good company and a, and a good, very patriarchal company, actually, in a lot of ways. They, they really care. Their benefits and you know, all the typical things you look for in, in big companies uh, was, was very, very good. Yeah. So, and I certainly could have stayed on there. But uh, well, I feel like you learn from those experiences, too. I mean, it's just a different world. You know, it so. is. Yeah. When you're running a company at that scale, they were successful, not because they were dumb, because they were smart. And they grew big, but you're, when you're running a company like that, it's hard to change horses midstream, and it's very difficult. Um, you know, when you see, when you look back and you see what Microsoft did with the internet, when you see what IBM did with the personal computer, large companies that said, "Wow, we should be doing that," and then some companies are able to to make that switch. Philips eventually did do it, and the yeah. LED business became one of the the most profitable in the lighting group, which was a ten billion dollar company yeah, in itself. Philips, I think, now leads that. That charge, right? I mean, it's like the well, they've line, actually right? spun it out into another company called Signify now. Oh, interesting! <laughs> I did not know that. So there's a this long evolution and rapid transition uh, as these companies grow and as the technologies mature. It, it, LEDs. Do they spin it out because they just can't run effectively with that that model, or uh, it's that... very difficult when it's again it's a semiconductor based company, whereas traditional lighting required a significant capital investment in uh, glass furnaces and taking sand from. And no joke, from one end of a factory to the light bulbs at the other. That's cool. So all the capital infrastructure required to build lamps was... I mean, obviously, the not best way to do it with modern technology, but interesting to see where it came from. And right. Came... And it was. at that you know When that technology was developed, this tungsten filament, the, the, uh, the, lamp, the lamp machines that can make a thousand lamps an hour. Wow. You know, that was... All mechanical technology um, back then. I mean, that stuff is beautiful in a way. Yeah, I mean, it really it's is. Different. It's a different kind of beauty. But yeah, and those companies did that well, and they scaled their business. And then they had the channels to the market. They knew how to work with the large warehouses like Home Depot and Lowe's and so forth. How you position the planogram. So it's as much the marketing and the support of the logistics as well as that. And small companies found found it tough to do that. It makes a lot of sense. But a lot of people now can take semiconductor-based systems and, and start a new company. And it happens a lot in China, for example, so the low cost. So you'll see many different brands now if you go to a store and look at 
the lighting section. And that's true yeah. of computers, it's true of everything. Yeah, so. makes a lot of sense. The card is not in that position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're building small numbers, you know, it's uh, a high cost, uh, high margin products. So high value, high margin. Um, similar to what SK does. I mean, you know, we, we do not sell volume at all. Right. Right. But you're able to do many different types of things rapidly. And that's, yeah, that's important. Our clients seem to like it. <laughs> yeah. No, they, if they, when they have a different idea, they want to, Hey, what if we did this? What if we changed it? Or, now we got this other project going. We'd like to, to work on that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and eventually, you know, we'll get replaced because they'll, they'll in-house, you know, the things they really like. But it's it's fun to work on those, you know, unique and interesting yeah. challenges. And it's hard really to do quickly. What you just described is hard to do in a large company. And I had experience in this where we had an, we started an innovation group. And then some of the engineers working on the standard products go, hey, how come they get to do the cool stuff? Why not me? And then it's just a little bit of jealousy. I shouldn't have rolled my eyes, but <laughs> yeah, but it's true. And... I, I've seen, I, I noticed that first time when I was at, uh, well, let's say the Joy Mining Company. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, you know, we, we were the advanced automation group and my group is responsible for taking, you know, four story high mining shovels and putting LIDAR and, you know, sonar and radar and, you know, the controls algorithms to run it like a robot on there. Exactly. And yeah. we, we, we sort of took on easy challenges, like making it not hit itself using basic kinematics, mm -hmm. and, you know, just, just, you know, what you would consider to be really low hanging fruit from a robotics perspective, right. you know, and, but I mean, for the mine industry, it was super duper advanced. And I mean, we got special treatment, you know, I mean, we, got to, you know, kind of have like a more relaxed dress code and, you know, or, you know, you could take like a longer lunch if you wanted and, you know, you could walk across the factory and basically commandeer resources for your project. Wow. And I mean, you, you could do a lot of stuff, but then that created jealousy and the politics made it really difficult to... Yeah. How come they get the resources and I can't, I can't do this over here on the production line? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. I think yeah, it's hard. A company has to think about that when they manage their their culture and when they manage the the people in the company. You know, people are obviously going to be doing different types of jobs, but how do you do it in a way that everyone feels included and uh, productive and so forth? And that sounds like from what you're saying, it has to be a different company. Probably, but I mean, some companies did it by IBM's PC example. They actually took a group in Florida. They uh, completely separated from the rest of IBM, and even those who knew it in other parts of IBM. So they're oh, they're building toys down there. Oh. So they poo poo it, and then it became a pretty large. Uh, so it's almost like Lockheed factory. Martin Skunk Works a little bit, where yeah, you know, well, that, part of this big parent corp. I'm right. sorry, you had a you had a comment there. Well, the Skunk Works was also a lot of very top secret, super advanced stuff. And I don't, I don't think the freedom that they had, you know, when uh, Kelly Johnson who started the Skunk Works, yeah. Um, you know, he isolated his team. He didn't want to be bothered by the managers. There were a lot <laughs> of bad a lot of leeway doing that too, because yeah. he was such a genius at what he did. Exactly. And he managed a, a great team. He got the best best in the world and he got the resources he needed. But he was completely separated. That's why, you know, I but they were like, one of the first groups, I think, to put all the engineers in one room together. So yeah. you know, the mechanical guys, the electrical guys, the aeronautics guys. Because they were all effectively working on the same problem. I'm gonna yeah. build an entire aircraft of titanium. I'm going to fly three times faster than the speed of sound. You, you, yep. you, you can't use traditional thinking, right? And they did a lot of prototyping, a lot of- But you can't not have the groups talking to each other if you wanna do it at any kind of speed. Exactly. But I, I think their model, I mean, for, it sounds like you've studied, I mean, I mean probably read Ben Wrench's book as yes. well. And, yeah, years ago. And I loaned it to somebody and I've lost it, so I'll have to get it back soon. It happened to my copy of the Food Lab. Son of a bitch, okay. <laughs> Actually, a dollar a bitch was a woman, but anyway. okay. <laughs> um, but um, you know, it's okay. I'm glad she's enjoying it now. But anyway, a really good book, and one of the reasons I look up to it was that um, I think it set the standard for a lot of what we do in research and development to be able to have you know a small group that has good communication, very focused, very focused, yeah. but you know also just the freedom to to not be bound by bureaucracy you know, as much as you can help. Well, that's a good point because they they had very specific things they wanted to build: super high speed, high altitude aircraft, spying aircraft, and so forth. 
And then, but you look at a great R and D example, which is Bell Labs. Yeah, they yeah. were given complete freedom to do anything that had to do with communications, which is pretty much everything. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but out of that came Shockley Semiconductor came out of Bell Labs, right? Or am I mistaken on that? Well, you had um, the inventors of the transistor, Bardeen, Shockley, and um, gosh, why am I forgetting his name? Um, yes, they and then Shockley is a whole weird story in itself, but. Um, but yeah, he he left, went to California, uh, started um, Fairchild Semiconductor. Um, oh wow, which is still around today. Yeah, but there then there were the traitorous eight, right? The eight people who left to form Intel, led by I believe Bob Noyce. I didn't know about this. Yeah, it's a it's a great great story, um, and Gordon Moore was part of that. Wow. And some very well known people in the semiconductor industry, but that's Silicon Valley grew from that effort. There was a uh, Fred Turman at Stanford who was also responsible for incorporating startups and the curriculum and the work being done at Stanford. And people were staying there and, you know, apricot fields and so forth were disappearing fast because they were building these fabs. They were building semiconductor businesses. And, uh, yeah. And it grew from this hardware business eventually many years later to software businesses. Um, Which seems to be the predominant force in Silicon Valley today is, is software. It's by far software. Yeah. Yeah, the money, the people. By almost any measure, um, it, it's sort of you, you and I both love hardware, and uh, investors sure. don't. Yeah, that's and true. Most many investors don't understand, even though the canonical example today is Apple that created a hardware system and a software ecosystem that generates yeah. immense profits. Um, hardware is still, I think, uh, super important. You can't. Well, it's definitely looked down upon by investors, I think, because I mean, I don't know. Because it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's really hard. I think there's some good recent talks and discussions around how hard it is. And uh, I, had a, I had a talk recently with somebody I won't name, but they were talking about how they'd had success um, of the hundreds of million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue variety on a software project. And I'm being intentionally vague here. Um, and they went to their investors with the hardware idea and, you know, they kind of got this cross-eyed stare, but then they pointed to their past success and it was, all right, here's some money. You know? <laughs> but they had to plead for it. <laughs> well, and they had to plead for it and they had to point out a software success in order yeah. to. Yeah, in know. order to do that. Yeah. yeah. I think if, um, you know, a good example is Carta, in fact, we're really a software company. We don't have a single mechanical engineer or electrical engineer on staff. Really? Uh, there are a couple of people with degrees in those areas, but we're not designing that hardware. We take COTS components, commercial off-the-shelf off yeah. off -the components. Thank you. We buy LiDAR. I don't want to design LiDAR. Um, that makes I, sense. We buy IMUs. We buy cameras. We buy computer boards complete. We put all of those together, but it's a software that makes it hum. It's a software that makes it work. That's awesome. Um, but, you know, the only bespoke parts are the plastic and metals that sort of hold everything together, the enclosures and so yeah. forth. Um, there were there are in two of our products there are um, uh, circuit boards, uh, PCBAs, printed circuit board array, uh, uh, printed printed circuit board components. I don't are, know what the A stands for in PCBA for assembly. assembly. Printed circuit board assembly. assembly. Nice. So uh, I should know that. Thank you. But the designs are relatively simple, and we didn't do the design. We have we work with consultants and contractors and developers, yeah. and uh, right now Carnegie Robotics is building two of our products. It's uh, awesome. They so, do good stuff. Yeah, we're very, very happy with them. Um, we've had mixed experiences with, with others, but uh, I'll just talk about the positive side. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we purposely chose to minimize the hardware risk by using available components. They're not ideal. Most LiDARs today are not built for 3D mapping. They're built for safety for automobiles. Makes a lot of sense. They have sense. a relatively small field of view, or we would like to have full hemispheres or yeah. full full spheres for that. I wonder, just because of, I mean, I'm sure you've seen Waymo's LiDARs on the top of their cars and- The and honeycombs, the yeah. yeah. I wonder what kind of field of view that provides. I mean, nobody it's knows exactly 90 that. degrees in one direction. I think it's 120 in the other. And um, you. <laughs> well, we've looked at them. Yeah, um, that's cool. Do they sell those to external people? I thought those were only for them. do. Um, okay. I believe they've changed the uh, business approach, but early on when they first started going out, they had some very restrictive clauses in what you could use them in. You couldn't sell them to government. You couldn't sell systems that use them to government entities. Interesting. You couldn't work with any other automotive manufacturer. And so that's why you only see them on those Google cars and no other. Car Typically, there sense. are people using them externally, but I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a big or growing business. On that. It's. Yeah. It is a, by all measures a, a very good lidar. Yeah. Um, and they did that um, back when 
uh, I, I think Chris Ermson was running Google, um, the, the, auto, the autonomous driving section for Google at the time, and they were very, very frustrated with some of the commercial offerings from different companies. I won't name them. Yeah, well, that's um, what I've heard from some of the people I know at Waymo. So they had their own internal design effort to do that. And as we know from the lawsuits <laughs> um, in other Ermson's other companies. Classic Icarus style. Yeah, there were um, other LiDAR designs that were being done internally by companies. But it's it's hard, and it's hard to be a company that is vertically integrated that you know designs the sensors maybe designs the optics and the electronics to go in them and then i'm sure you need a boatload of money <laughs> you need a boatload of money and uh it's it's not clear because now we've got 30 competitors out there who are lowering prices improving performance and getting excellent results you're not a company that's focused just on autonomous driving is in the long run is going to find it very challenging to compete with 30 companies. So what you do is you work with, you partner with those companies. You work to get the best LiDAR you can. Yeah. Um, even to the point maybe of sharing or licensing your technology to them in order to make a better LiDAR. That makes a lot of sense. So we, we use one LiDAR, I won't mention who what company it is, uh, for one of our products where uh, the, the company is uh, not very good at understanding what 3D mapping requires. And they came back without talking to the robotics community, to the 3D mapping community, to the surveying community, and ended up with a device that is not being sold. That's unfortunate. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we have a lot of collective wisdom collectively, not 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 just Carter, not just, certainly not, not just me, yeah. of what a good 3D mapping LiDAR looks like. And, and I don't, like I said, I don't want to design them. I don't want to build them. <laughs> I want other companies to do that. And there are more companies coming out of the woodwork. The other great thing that we're starting to see is that the component levels, the chips and the, uh, oh gosh, the uh, Vixels, the laser devices that are being used inside of them, um, and the arrays uh, are, are now being addressed by other companies specializing in those technologies. Oh, cool. So you'll start to see fully integrated components going into lighters which will make this whole integration awesome. piece even better i still won't build a lighter but i'm so glad that these companies are going to be using <laughs> those companies so it's all moving well, somebody's downstream. getting rich off of it too so i mean like possibly yeah. uh, but lighter prices are dropping fast 20 to 30 percent a year well that's why you have to hit high volumes which is I mean, again not something i think you or i are the biggest right fans of but <laughs> You know, I mean, well, when you hit high volumes, you're trying to hit a middle of a market, which is some sweet spot that may not perfectly serve everyone, but they'll be so inexpensive. Like, oh, heck, for that price, I'll make do. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, across the board. And the lighters are going to get a lot cheaper. Just look at the, I haven't even seen the latest Apple. I feel like the Intel Real Sense when it, it, when it was a thing was, was kind of like that. Like, yeah, that's only $200. I can do all that, you know, and like, great. But it's coarse. It's a very narrow field of view. Noisy. <laughs> it's noisy, but you can use it. USB, which is a major failure mode. There's... Oh, a USB C. Yeah. Yeah, you know, which I mean, we had a thing we tried putting seven of them on, and it would just crash constantly because of the USB trying to run all that stuff on a USB C. Oh, device. I see. So, yeah, you, you need a better. And I, I would I imagine talked you to could... somebody at the field robotics center that said that they were actually told by Intel when they got them against a wall to use relays to power cycle. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? That's when they failed. Yeah. Oh man. So. Well, I think Intel is getting out of some of that. They I are. That's why I said uh, it was. Yeah. Of it is. Um, but if you look announced at... their intent to pull the T series, the tracking cameras. Okay. Um, and then I think the D's are. If I had to speculate, I don't know what the future holds, but. Well, it's interesting they, they tried that. I mean, I, I think it's good companies like Intel are doing that. Uh, the other um, big advance has been in the ones you now used in the iPhones and the iPads. Oh, I've, I've not actually followed that that closely. So Sony worked with Apple and I think PrimeSense to uh, create this sort of integrated piece, which is a LiDAR. The, the initial application of that was for augmented reality, which yeah. does an exceptional job at and I think also for computational photography, the ability to use range measurements what to do focus. What are some of the current use cases for augmented reality that seem to be driving those sensors? Uh, I think there's a long-term view that, uh, you know, we're going to get beyond Pokemon types of things. Yeah, and, okay, cool. Um, but I just recently, the other day, I was using um, an app where they were showing, I think it was actually Verizon had uh, created a um, virtual reality piece used on a phone 
uh, to show buildings and then you could walk around the building. You know, I, I could display it in my, as though it were in my living room and I could walk about it as though I had a window That's awesome. to see that. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And I, I think there's going to be more and more of that. I think instructions for doing, like if you're doing a complex engine disassembly, being able to register the image that you see on the actual thing that you're trying to work on and have little annotations and pointing to things, communicating with other it people. It was a big part of my master's thesis was, I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was a really kludgy, you know, early stage, you know, eight years ago version of that. But, right. I mean, it, you know, it, it was interesting because, um, and you know, that's something that was fun to work on. Yeah. I really believed in. Well, I think I, years ago, I worked with a medical robotics startup here in Pittsburgh. It eventually, over time, transformed into Blue Belt. Oh, cool. You probably know. They, yeah, now, we just had Craig on. Uh, oh, Craig Markowitz. Video, great, yeah. great guy. Um, they ended up selling to Smith & Nephew. But before that, there was a lab at CME called the Mr. Cass Lab, which was doing medical robotics and computer-assisted surgery. And one of the things that the group had developed, I wasn't... That's cute, Mr. Cass. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we called it. Um, yeah. And I wasn't working on that piece specifically, but I got involved because they wanted me to help create this company around this called Cosurgica, which was computer-assisted surgery in a sort of Latinized form. Yeah. But uh, they were using um, displays where you would uh, project an image onto it and then use registration for the femoral implant and the, and the femur. And so uh, what it would do is show you where the where the implant would go and uh, it would help the doctor in terms of registration. This is for a knee replacement? Uh, hip and knee, but we were cool. primarily focused on hip at the time. Awesome. We called it hip nav. Nice. <laughs> so hip navigation. Yeah, it makes sense. So Tony DeJoya, the doctor, was involved with us and uh, we had some great researchers, good friends who I'm still good friends with many, many years later. Um, we had a lot of fun doing it. That's awesome. But it was pretty far ahead of its time and the yeah, technology was wasn't quite there yet a bunch of stuff like that my dad i think worked on a startup called bonecraft that was mm. um trying to get these braces to get a bone to heal properly okay and i just don't think it was there yet you know it was like you know adjust these screws to this amount and huh. i mean and there were those projects i think in the 90s which were you know artificial intelligence assisted you know diagnostic tools right right like, Expert Systems, remember those? <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know by that name. So Expert Systems were uh, sort of a list of knowledge of what you had, and you would sort of input sp specific knowledge about things, and it would come up with maybe a diagnosis. Oh, so cool. if you entered symptoms, so internal medicine was probably the most famous one. It was actually done at the University of Pittsburgh. It was an yeah. expert system called Internist. And what you do is you'd enter the symptoms that you were seeing, and it would come up with something and awesome. doctors can't know every disease. They can't even suggest what to look for if they don't know. Yeah, it makes sense. But this expert system, if you entered a, even a small number of symptoms, would give you, hey, it might be one of these. Here's what you can do to test for the next step. Oh, cool. To help and narrow it down. Tree. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it worked quite well. I don't know why it didn't continue or was, I wonder. didn't take off. Uh, because yeah, internal that's not really a threat to an internist you know like that's that's right it, it, yeah. it's it was very it was a very complex flow chart but it was quite good at helping to diagnose like rocky mountain spotted fever and here in pittsburgh you probably don't see it that often but there are very particular symptoms that you can look for in it and this system of course would have all those Pretty things like database exactly yeah. Awesome. so yeah it's more interesting watching the history of ai you know i had AI courses as an undergrad at CMU, but um, it's come a long, long way. It seems like, I, I mean, I look at it as, you know, something I understand very little, and there's people way smarter than me that work on that. And that's well, one of those things where I know my limitations, and that's one of them. But well, I think there are certain pieces of it. I have not kept up the field. I, just, I know the basic principles, and we were running neural nets on NavLab, the first of the big autonomous vehicles that I helped build. And uh, back in the 80s, and uh, it was is going with a huge sonar array, or is that something different I'm thinking of? So the sonar array you're thinking of was never mounted on the big vehicles. It was mounted on Terragator, which is a six-wheeled right. six skid steer yeah. device. You're absolutely right. And before that, it was mounted on some of the indoor robots that Hans Moravec was building at Carnegie Mellon. So Uranus was Uranus and uh, Neptune were the two robots. Oh, cool. So the theses theses of um, uh, Chuck Thorpe, uh, Larry Matthews, Alberto Alfez, these are all sort of giants in the early 
autonomous vehicle world um, were generated using the fact that you knew what it meant from that big summer. Yeah. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, that I believe it's still on display over at NREC, and it's under a plastic dome. And I, I believe a lot it of it would people... never work under there. <laughs> That's right. Our... Most people don't understand that. Yeah. Um, but you know, they just wanted to protect it from prying hands and dust and so forth. So. But Terrigator was the predecessor. You had Morvex machines, which were scuttling around the lab up in Doherty. You had uh, Red began building these big machines, not only for Through My Island, but later Terrigator, uh, really led by John Bears, who created uh, Terrigator with a team over a summer. 120 days start to finish. They Holy had it crap. Running. But Terrigator got used for years after that to do some early testing on the sidewalks. Well, the wasn't economies. it like Chuck was telling me that it could... Uh... It would take, you know, like a couple minutes that it would move a meter. Yes. It would take a couple more minutes. It was ridiculous. to slow. a data center, right, to do that. Well, uh, I actually helped uh, initiate a um, communication system using radio. Oh, badass. Uh, radio. Uh, it was with a local company here. Bob Unitish led it. And, so you uh, still had, you know, an external compute, but you, you at least were wireless. Exactly. That's so cool. we were going up to my office, which was on the fourth floor of Doherty. Then the network connections down to the machine rooms, which were running on KL10s and so cool. large machines. It was, uh, you know, the, our phones are orders of magnitude more powerful than all the computers we have. Well, still, like all the stuff that you were able to do to make it work with the stuff available at the time. It was uh, pretty piecemeal impressive. at times. But yeah, we would stand out there and I'd occasionally run out to Terrigator. It still is with different stuff, though. I mean, <laughs> trying to solve other problems. It is, yeah. yeah. But yeah, we'd fill up Terrigator with gas every six hours or so. and. It would sit there, run, the computers are going, the transmitters are transmitting, the uh, images were getting analyzed, and then we move another meter or so. Eventually, we got it to the point where, over a, a relatively short period of time, we got it move, just crawling slowly. That's so awesome. 10 centimeters a second or so. And then by that time, by mid-86, we had um, NavLab 1, the big blue van. And that was to... <laughs> we took... We took the opposite extreme, right? We took Terrigator and we knew all the computers were in the building. We didn't want to deal with that anymore. So we basically housed all the computers and the researchers on board the vehicle. <laughs> and so the back of the vehicle was just this you know, big 16 gauge shell with generators, power systems, wow. uh, an electrical uh, switching panel. We had uh, buttons in the front that could start and stop the vehicle in emergency. We had a, a belt drive to the steering wheel from a small motor right underneath where if you were sitting holding the wheel, it was yeah. right here, <laughs> right, right in your crotch. Yeah, you definitely want a belt guard on that. But not only that, we had to increase the cooling, we had to increase the alternator size. I mean, all of these things that for a vehicle moving that slowly and using that much power, 20 kilowatts or more, you needed to do that. We were also using- 20 experiment. kilowatts. The, the generators kept growing. I started with a small Honda, five kilowatts, went to 10, and then eventually went to a hydraulic drive and to 20. <laughs> No, no that was enough because we were also running air conditioning to uh, do that. So that I guess you would have to to have that kind of compute. Oh yeah, we had these big arrays of Sun Microsystem computers, systolic arrays. Oh, those were cool. The uh, the architecture on those things was incredible. The Spark Spark yeah. stations, yeah. And then we also had um, uh, systolic arrays, which was an experimental systems developed by HD Cummings through John Webb led this, led software development for that on the vehicle. And, uh, so lots. I'm not, of I'm not as familiar with those. Uh, there are pipeline architectures, so you can start at, if you can if you can create a process to solve, say, an imaging problem by filling a pipeline. Then, with every clock cycle, you're actually doing many operations Got it. at the same time. Yeah, so I studied that in undergrad. Oh, okay. But Kung, who later yeah. went to Harvard, uh, had some marvelous work in that, which led to all kinds of developments in parallel architectures. That was one of the great. It still is one of the great, great things about CMU is the interdisciplinary nature of all the different departments, different scientists working together on large, massive projects. And uh, it was one of the greatest lessons, I think, out of, out of CMU, as well as technology integration itself being a technology. Right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I always enjoyed my work with the Field Robotics Center and at CMU yeah. just because, I mean, there's we, so we many people grew, that are... We grew up there. <laughs> yeah, there's so many people that are interested and, you know, want to... Hey, what are you working on? You know, exactly. it's like, and it's three in the morning. You're like, it is getting big, though. I've talked yeah. to people there in the last few years about not just the FRC, the Field Robotics Center, but the School of Computer Science itself. It, it, it is gigantic. The whole School of Computer Department of Computer Science, I should say, at that time, was a very small family-like department. Yeah. But it's grown. And I, 
I, I feel like it's still kind of, at least when I went to school, well, not that long ago, it, it was kind of, I mean, you could walk into that cluster in the basement of the Gates building they've probably built since you were there. Yes. And you could just start talking to people and making friends. And before you knew it, you know, you'd be able to go in there, you know, it's similar. Night That's great. Oh, you mean where the cafe scene. is there? At the yeah. Bottom? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, I really hope that that continues, uh, that they don't end up developing silos and because uh, in the FRC, although we might have a dozen projects going on, everyone was helping in. I, I can remember one yeah. one late night. I was. Well, I, I mean, you, you kind of took joy in being able to help somebody. Yes, with their exactly. And, you know, maybe I'm good at running the mill, and you know, you're better at you know this other thing, and so. Let, oh, you had let's people with other out. all kinds of great talents. You could yeah. you could go to in a moment's notice. I remember late one night I was working on the robot for uh, Kennedy Space Center to go into the shuttle, and. Um, just trying to figure out how am I going to assemble this thing. And John Bears on a, on his way home walked by. So what you up to, Kev? And I, I said I'm I'm trying to I want to assemble this tonight so I can, you know, we have a demo coming up shortly. And uh, he stopped and we worked for several hours and we got the thing together. And it was just that kind of thing happened all the time. That's awesome. So it's uh, yeah, the fact that like Chuck Whitaker personally took the time to teach me all kinds of machine tools and yeah, you know and. I would drop everything and help if, you know, George Kanner needed something on, you know, something yep. or other. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great place, a very collegial and very fun place. And there's lots of stories, <laughs> good war stories from, the, from those early days, too. I agree. <laughs> so there's some funny stuff I saw with some of the pipeline robots where, you know, you see, saw like the, um, I remember exactly how they fixtured it, but they, they took a bunch of the stuff off the bridge port just so they could use it like a drill to get certain holes in there. Yeah. It's too big to fit on the actual. <laughs> <laughs> you have and, to take the knee all the way down and the drill yeah. all the way up. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw somebody, I'm not going to name their name, but you know who it is. Um, you don't know them from the story, but they pulled the safety all the way up on the bandsaw and they were running it with like a 12 inches of blade exposed. Oh, geez. And I said, what the hell are you doing? That's super dangerous. Yeah. But it was somebody that was like high up enough in the department that I, I just, I was like, all right. And it's... Were they resawing something? or they were just sawing something in a really unsafe way and uh, it was one of those things where like i wasn't gonna rat them out like even if they weren't you know i just but like i was ready to call 911 or you know like i you know i was like looking for the nearest tourniquet like you know i was just wow. i was just anticipating a yeah looking injury. looking back it's a wonder most of us survived <laughs> <laughs> someday for another time i'll tell you about the tooling accident <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe round two. Cool. So is, is that a good note to end on? Should we, should we call it? Sure. I mean, it's so much fun being here. In Pit uh, so I do want to sort of say yeah, absolutely. One, one thing. The Pittsburgh Robotics Network is something that's come together. I started in 2016, but now it's gone thank far you. further than... Well, thank you. Uh, it's come far further than um, even what, what I had hoped for it because... Uh, a few of us um, continue to stay engaged. We're, uh, uh, Joel Reed has become the executive Joel's director. Been awesome in that role. Yeah, and I know he's on one of your yeah. podcasts as well. Yeah. So he's taken the horse by the reins, and he's really driven that organization in a great way. We had we were actually supposed to have a call earlier this evening, but he was tied up. And um, uh, but he's done a, just a fantastic job. Yeah, know? I can't say enough good things about Joel in that capacity. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he's found his. His, his niche, if you will. Um, yeah. he's, he's done a lot of things here. Um, he he is one of the people who's led organizations here, has been part of it, but he's he's sort of non-technical in his, his background. But here in Pittsburgh, we, we need you more kind of, of need that. that. Yeah, you need you do. somebody we, that's good at sales in order to make that organization work. Exactly. And, and we yeah. have the technical depth and breadth here. We have a constant stream of students coming out of Carnegie Mellon and Pitt and other colleges in the region. Yeah. Um, but what we need are salespeople, marketing people, finance people, HR people, all of that. And le yeah. leaders who don't necessarily have to be technical. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, it uh, helps to be a little bit technical, but not it, to have it that does. be your sole focus. You can build that knowledge. Well, you know, Joel's a good example where well, he's of absorbed a lot of this over yeah. years because he's been around us. He can't, yeah. You know, even if he doesn't want to, he's going to absorb some of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no good. I mean, Jen knows, like, she picked up robotics and, you know, yeah. she's so quick at it. You know, getting her mind around it. One of the wonderful things, and I've w seen it watching my kids grow up, is the uh, advent of broad use of the internet and being able to look at any subject matter, looking up things, and finding out what's going on. It's been a huge help, I think, for a lot of people. So yeah, it's awesome. 
Well, good. Well, the Pittsburgh Royal Next Network will continue to grow. We've got over 100 companies, as I'm sure Joel said on his. Yeah, SK is one of them. Yep, exactly. Yeah. There, and there, yeah, there's all kinds of companies. You get companies with billion dollars of funding and companies that are garage startups. Yeah, exactly. So. And I'm a big fan. I, I can't thank you enough for the work you've done there. It's been tremendously helpful to us. And uh, you know, well, it's, a, it's definitely a team effort, it's not, not just me by any means. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.